If you've ever hosted a mouse as a house guest, you know they can be incredibly clever at finding your food. And that makes sense. They had to become better in traits like problem solving because we became better at hiding our food from them. Anya Guntar is with the Max Planck Institute in Germany. She says that battle of the minds has made mice craftier over time. The longer the mice live with humans, the better they are at problem solving. You see, there are more than a dozen subspecies of house mice worldwide, and each began cohabitating with humans at different times in our evolutionary history. come home to Alaska's frigid rivers to mate, lay their eggs, and die. The state salmon runs are some of the biggest in the world, but over the past few decades, those big salmon runs have featured ever smaller salmon. You know, you talk to people up there who've been fishing for a long time, and they're definitely able to tell you that, you know, we just don't see those really large, old salmon that we used to see. Krista Oak, a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Oak and colleagues at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and elsewhere analyzed records of fish size going back to the 1950s. They included data on some 12.5 million salmon, each of which had to be measured by someone from the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. And there's no question about it, salmon have shrunk. only three to five thousand years ago and that spread in evolutionary life histories among the three groups gave Gunther's team an opportunity they gathered 150 mice with constituents from all three groups and tested them with seven different food puzzles each puzzle was baited with a mealworm which the mice could only get by pushing or pulling a lid for example or extracting a ball of paper from a tube or my favorite opening the window of a lego house and they found that the longer a mouse variety had lived with humans, the more likely it was to solve these food puzzles. So basically what we are left at with trying to explain these results that we see is that the mice really developed higher or enhanced cognitive abilities while living with humans. Sockeye salmon today are 2.1% shorter than their ancestors. Chum salmon are 2.4% shorter, and coho are 3.3% shorter. Chinook or king salmon showed the greatest declines at 8%. That's an average difference of more than 2 inches in length. The study is in the journal Nature Communications. The researchers haven't nailed down the exact reasons behind this trend, but their analysis suggests that climate change and competition with wild and hatchery-raised salmon both play a role. They also discovered that much of the change in body size is due to fish returning from the ocean at a younger age now than in the past. Oak says fish could be returning earlier because they're reaching maturity faster for some reason, 
or because the ocean has become a riskier place for older salmon to survive. What could be happening is the salmon that otherwise would have returned large and old just aren't making it that long. attack could be the last thing you ever experience. It's a gory, violent process, and honeybees have had to adapt to stay alive. You've probably heard of those murder hornets that recently turned up in North America. This is not a story about those. This research takes us east to meet their cousins. Wellesley College biologist Heather Madela went to Vietnam to understand how Asian honeybees defend themselves from the hornets there. And in Vietnam, that's the giant hornet of Vespasaur. Typically, when a hornet invades an Asian honeybee hive, hundreds of bees surround the intruder and create what's called a heat ball. With the hornet caught in the center, the heat goes up and the oxygen goes down. The bees literally cook and choke the hornet to death. But Vespa Soror has figured out a way to avoid this trap. this size shift has massive ramifications for people and the environment. Oak and her team calculated that catching smaller fish may have already slashed the value of Alaska's commercial salmon fisheries by 21%. It's also likely reduced the food available to subsistence fishers, many of whom rely on stores of salmon to get them through the long, harsh winter by as much as 26%. On the ecological side, the researchers estimated that smaller fish lay 16% fewer eggs, which could depress salmon populations in the future. And the salmon bring 28% fewer nutrients into the watersheds where they spawn, according to the study. After they breed and die, their carcasses actually fertilize freshwater and terrestrial ecosystems with these marine-derived nutrients that are really important and that get used by all kinds of animals like bears and songbirds and even taken up into trees. With no single factor to blame for shrinking salmon, there's no obvious fix, Oak says. But there are still plenty of fish in the sea. They're just smaller than they used to be. to honeybees is when they flip into a multiple hornet attack strategy. And when they do this, they essentially want to kill all the adult defenders so that the colony is no longer protected. But in the face of this deadly bum rush, Asian honeybees have resorted to the scatological. And a lot of the beekeepers hadn't noticed them, or if they had, they didn't know what they were. But there was a handful of beekeepers who had seen these spots those spots, it turned out, were poop. The hive's decision to dip into the dung pile didn't come lightly, though. The alternative to covering their house in sh**. years ago, the Sahara had extensive grasslands and was dotted with lakes and trees. But some 5,000 years ago, that green Sahara dried up to become the enormous desert we know today. And scientists now think that this climate shift had effects far away, including causing a mega drought in Southeast Asia. 
Kathleen R. Johnson, a paleoclimatologist and geochemist at the University of California, Irvine, says the key to that discovery were stalagmites collected in a cave in northern Laos. Stalagmites are really amazing archives of past climate variability. People are often more familiar with things like tree rings or ice cores or maybe ocean sediment cores, while stalagmites work in a similar way in that they are deposited over time. Johnson's team analyzed trace elements and carbon and oxygen isotopes in the hardened cave drippings. That information enables researchers to determine rainfall patterns over the millennia. And Johnson and her colleagues discovered signs of a thousand year long drought in Laos. same time the Sahara dried up, about 5,000 years ago. As for why the two events might be connected, the researchers simulated the drying out of the Sahara using climate models, and they included a couple things we know happened, including the subsequent disappearance of vegetation and a connected increase in airborne dust, and they found that those variables would have been capable of cooling down the Indian Ocean. And so those cooler ocean temperatures basically led to less moisture being, being brought by monsoon circulation during the summertime when that region gets most of its rainfall. The details are in the journal Nature Communications. One of Johnson's co-authors is Joyce White, a consulting scholar at the Penn Museum. She studies the human history of Southeast Asia. And her reaction when she first heard about the drought? I said, oh my God, that's the missing millennia. The missing millennia because she says archaeological data are scant in that part of Southeast Asia from four to 6,000 years ago. White says it's a critical period in which hunter-gatherers gave way to farmers. And there are a lot of debates about how the two periods related to each other, but we lacked the evidence in the area I'm most interested in, which is the Mekong Valley. actually forage on dung, which is a surprise in itself. Honeybees generally keep their nests clean and tidy. They're good at keeping diseases and pathogens out, two things that could be hiding in animal poop. And the thought of them collecting feces in the field and intentionally bringing it back home was pretty stunning. Whenever they detected a giant hornet nearby, but not other smaller hornets, the honeybees began to arrange bits of mammal or bird dung near the entrances to their hives. And the hornets themselves were less likely to land on a nest adorned with poop. If they did bother to land, they spent 94% less time attempting to break in. The study was published in the December 9 issue of the journal PLOS One. The researchers say this is the first time honeybees have ever been documented collecting non-plant matter. And because the bees are selective in what kind of poop they collect and use it in a very specific way, they say it actually qualifies as tool use, the first known instance in wild bees. It isn't clear why or how the poop shield works, but Madeline suspects that there must be some chemical inside the poop presumably derived from the plants that the animals originally ate, that either actively repels the hornets or camouflages the scent of the bees' nests. have notoriously poor eyesight, so they mostly rely on their noses to understand the world around them. But there's one interaction in which sound plays a key role. Southern white rhino males can either be dominant or subordinate, and only the dominant males hold and defend territories. New research finds that they eavesdrop on the calls of other males to know who is who. 
we found that uh, contact calls carry information uh, about the dominant status of the mail. That uh, means that uh, only by listening to the call, you can say if the mail is territorial or subordinate. Ivana Sinkova, a zoologist at the University of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. She and her team spent almost two years in South Africa's Shishlui Mfalozi Park, recording the social contact and courtship calls of male rhinos. American bees don't do this. Asian honeybees are a different species than the Western honeybees in Europe and North America. I just can't even totally capture how much fun it really was to do this work. I didn't have a lot of personal experience with Asian bees, and so meeting them was kind of like meeting the crazy cousin of the bees you know really well. These bees are a lot smaller, but they're very, very fast and very reactive. And that's because of the kind of hornet pressure that they've evolved under. They have evolved to fly quite quickly in zigzagging patterns as they're approaching their nest so that they're very hard to catch. Western honeybees did not evolve alongside hornets as did their Asian cousins, which makes them especially susceptible to hornet attacks in places where giant hornets become introduced. If Madela and her team can figure out how poop keeps hornets away, it might help North American beekeepers help their bees to survive, if the so-called murder hornets decide they like it here. Territorial male rhinos hold exclusive breeding opportunities with the female rhinos. Subordinate males could thus be interested in challenging the territorial male for dominance. But dominant males rarely lose their territories to subordinate males, at least while they're in prime condition. So responding to the challenge call quickly has little cost. But other dominant rhinos theoretically pose a larger risk. So when territorial rhinos heard other dominant males, they oriented towards the direction of the sound, but they took their time responding. The researchers think that the rhinos were being careful, waiting to acquire more information before reacting. And most of them did eventually investigate the source of the sound. Rhinos are always under a high risk of poaching. So parks and preserves usually keep tabs on every individual rhino they care for. Sinkova says that understanding their social dynamics could allow wildlife managers to more effectively manage their rhino herds, which ultimately enables them to better guard and protect the animals from poachers. Ravens are known for their exceptional intelligence. In fact, they're sometimes referred to as flying primates. We knew they are very smart, but nobody ever had really tested this using a big and comprehensive test battery, which also then really enabled us to say, is their cognitive performance similar to those of great apes or not? Simona Pika is a cognitive scientist at the University of Osnabrück in Germany. She and her colleagues wanted to see how ravens would measure up to primates across a wide array of tasks. So they subjected eight ravens to something called the Primate Cognition Test Battery. It's a series of 33 different tasks designed to assess various aspects of intelligence among primates.
Hundreds of millions of years ago, reptilian predators called ichthyosaurs swam the seas. Their fossils look fearsome, but paleobiologist Ryosuke Motani of UC Davis says they may have looked more like friendly dolphins. Yeah, maybe in life, ichthyosaurs might have been cute, but they are at least the smaller ones. Motani's team studied one such specimen found in southwest China. It was 240 million years old, 15 feet long, but it seemed to have some extra bones in it, which Motani's team determined to be the remains of a 13-foot-long thalatosaur, or sea lizard, the ichthyosaur had swallowed. And spoiler alert, the only reason they were able to see this animal in the belly of the ichthyosaur is that this gigantic meal never got digested. The ichthyosaur died soon after swallowing it. Motani was careful to say they're not sure exactly why the ichthyosaur perished, but the specimen has a broken neck, so he gave a speculative play-by-play. Perhaps, he says, the ichthyosaur snapped at the sea lizard, but the lizard fought back. For example, one test is a game of cups. You may have seen it at fair. You put an object under one of three cups, move the cups around, and then guess which cup the object's under. Other tasks tested the raven's ability to determine cause and effect or to understand different quantities. Peanuts were a popular test item to keep the birds motivated. Overall, the researchers found that four-month-old ravens, which you might think of as teenage ravens, did just as well on most tasks as adult chimps and orangutans, except on tests of spatial skills. And the fighting between the two was fierce, probably. So the ichthyosaur fought to subdue its prey, damaging its neck in the process. Then it had to dislodge the prey's bony head and tail from its juicy midsection. Now, the predator had to do it through jerking and twisting, like the crocodiles do. Also bad for the neck. And finally, the ichthyosaur had to swallow the animal, perhaps using inertia or gravity to shove the prey down its gullet. And the chances are, by the time it was ingested, maybe the neck damage was had accumulated to a certain level, and maybe the neck could not support the head. Details of that ancient battle appear in the journal iScience. And the reason why this analysis matters is you can only infer so much about who ate who by looking at teeth. This fossil offers direct evidence that these ancient beasts sometimes bit off a whole lot more than they could chew. was a little bit surprising for us, but we used a test battery which was designed to test primate cognition. And these are tasks which may make sense for human children and maybe great apes, right? And now we use this for a species which is very different. They are flying, they have beaks, they communicate with their beaks, they don't have hands, whatever. So I would say here that maybe the task we used to test their spatial skills um, could be improved. The results appear in the journal Scientific Reports. Kaylee Swift is a behavioral ecologist who studies crows and other corvids at the University of Washington. She says she was impressed by the results. a bird called the hermit warbler. It breeds along the U.S. West Coast. They all kind of look the same. They have a cute little uh, yellow head and a gray body. Brett Furness, a biostatistician at the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Typically, 
birds sing the same one song within one region because the song attracts mates, and different regions can have slightly different dialects of the song. But what we also noticed that there were some places that were exceptions to this rule. That some places there was、uh, more than one song in the same place, and so we were curious why that would be the case. To investigate, Furness and his team recorded hermit warbler songs, lots of them. We had to go all over California, so we went to a hundred different locations throughout the state and all the different potential habitats of the species. Of the tests were, but says it can be hard to assess intelligence by comparing across species. I'd like to see a sort of shift in our language from comparing ravens to primates, like calling them flying primates, to rethinking like how we scale animals and and not putting them on such a linear scale, right? Where we're like, wow, birds are as smart as apes. That's amazing. Who would have thought? It's like, well, there's just. There's a bunch of different really smart animals, and they their natural history informs different aspects of their physical and social cognition. And like, it's much less linear than the narrative we often tell. The researchers analyzed all the hermit warbler songs they collected and discovered that the hermit warbler doesn't just violate the usual one song per region rule; they positively demolish it. Doing this over a period of ten years, we found actually an amazing thirty-five different dialects across the state. Here are just two examples of dialects. Slow down for easier comparison. But why would the bird repeatedly alter its song when any changes could affect its ability to attract a mate? The answer is wildfire. And basically, the idea is that hermit warblers are very sensitive to fire in the short term, and so they will abandon an area temporarily, even if it's just a an understory or a low severity fire that doesn't destroy the whole stand. They've learned a lot about the species, but there are still some outstanding mysteries. Why is it that high-ranking individuals, and in particular high-ranking males, often are more、um, successful than low-ranking males in terms of reproduction? In spotted hyenas, in contrast to many other mammals, males don't fight、um, to access a high social rank, and they, they also don't fight to access、um, breeding partners. And so it is quite puzzling why high-ranking males, if they don't fight and they are not necessarily more attractive to females, why they should be more successful than males of lower social rank. So this creates a vacuum, and then other hermit warblers singing rival dialects move in into this vacuum, and then you end up maybe a few years later with two or more different dialects in the same place. The study was published in the journal The Oc Ornithological Advances. Even though the California hermit warblers sing multiple songs, Furness says that such musical diversity might actually work in the hermit warblers' favor. 
they may have greater resiliency to things like that are stressors to our natural habitats like climate change. And so understanding that helps us to make better conservation decisions to protect uh, biodiversity, but it's also what uh, makes the outdoors interesting and a beautiful place to be because you can go to one part of the state and hear hermit wilderness singing a certain way, and you can go to another part of the state and they sing a different way. And even though you might not know it's a hermit warbler, your experience outdoors is enriched by that diversity. Davidian had nearly 400 fecal samples collected from 120 male hyenas. She analyzed the hormones inside of them and discovered that interactions among male hyenas were more stressful for lower ranking males. And as a result, they spent more time alone. The results were published in the journal Functional Ecology. And the consequence of that is that lower ranking males, they spend less time courting females and are therefore less successful in terms of the number um, of offspring they produce compared to high ranking males who spend most of their time uh, courting females. All that time spent alone recovering from stress means that the lower ranking hyenas aren't spending their time courting females. And the females that they do manage to spend time with are themselves also of lower rank. There are some 250 million cars in America, 250 million cars in the country with just over 300 million people. And most of those vehicles, of course, are gas powered. This poses a huge challenge given the limited supplies of all and the growing urgency of the global warming crisis. But there is good news, according to our guests today. And that is we have the know-how and the technology to build sleek fast automobiles that don't use gasoline. These vehicles of tomorrow are powered by hydrogen, electricity, biofuels, and digital technology, and they already exist. So what's stopping us from putting them on the roads? Our guests today will help answer that. Researchers think it has to do with the fact that lower ranking males tend to be newcomers within hyena clans. It takes time to develop their support networks among other males. They do have to spend a lot of time uh, building up and maintaining these relationships before they can even think about courting females. So for male spotted hyenas, it might be that the best path towards romance is to begin with a bromance. <coughs> Roses get handed out on Valentine's Day, but growing roses has an environmental impact worse than many other crops. Start with climate change. Most roses in the U.S. and Europe are imported from warmer climes. All that flying and trucking adds thousands of metric tons of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Then there's all the water needed to, well, water the flowers. And the runoff fouled by copious quantities of pesticides needed to make the roses look perfect. There's also the wildlife and workers poisoned by all that fumigation. Add to that habitat destruction where floral plantations displace native forest and wetlands. 
Finally, there's the refrigeration needed to keep those blooms fresh. The electricity is often produced by burning fossil fuels, and the refrigerant gases also exacerbate climate change. A more sustainable and possibly more romantic approach is to go with flowers certified by outfits like Veriflora, or even better, whatever flowers are in season locally. Of course, that's not much help for those of us in wintry climes. Maybe try writing a poem. Let's see. Roses are red, violets are blue. Whether you're a pro gamer or you dip your toes into that world every once in a while, chances are you got stuck while playing a video game once, or was even gloriously defeated by one. I know I have. Maybe in your frustration, you kicked the console a little. Maybe you took it out on the controllers, or if you're an 80s kid like me, made the joystick pay. Now, a group of computer scientists from Uber AI are taking revenge for all of us who've been in this situation before. Using a family of simple algorithms stacked Go Explore, they went back and beat some of the most notoriously difficult Atari games whose chunky blocks of pixels and 8-bit tunes had once challenged, taunted, and even enraged us. are common, but actually counting them is no easy task. Even the brightest can be hard to see. Of course, bright black holes is a bit of an oxymoron, but when supermassive black holes at the center of a galaxy feed, the material falling into them heats up, giving off a bright glow across the electromagnetic spectrum. Infrared light in particular is good to look for when black hole hunting. Some feasting black holes are obscured by gas and dust, which absorbs much of their glow, but they still shine in the infrared. It's no surprise, then, that NASA's infrared WISE spacecraft found a bunch. WISE launched in 2009 to survey the entire sky in the infrared. Now researchers have used WISE data to count the luminous black holes in a well-known corner of the sky called the Cosmos Field. In just that tiny region, WISE found about 130 glowing black holes, or active galactic nuclei. The study will appear in the Astrophysical Journal. Extrapolating from this small area, at least 2 million active black holes dot the sky confirming that these extreme astrophysical objects are common indeed. degeneration causes visual distortion and even complete loss of sight. When the wife of chemistry Nobel laureate Walter Cohn was diagnosed with macular degeneration, he wanted to do something. I spoke with him at the recent Lindau Nobel laureate meeting in Germany. We are developing a corrective device, including interaction with the patient who is following a certain routine and who tells us his perceptions that arise. A macular degeneration patient looks at a completely regular grid on a computer screen, but because of the condition, the grid will appear distorted. The patient uses a mouse to adjust the grid to appear normal. We receive from the patient an edited piece of graph paper, and from the way the patient edits it, we can tell what the distortions are that he perceives, and from this, we can then develop devices that correct these distortions. Work. Let's start with the basics. 
When AI processes images of the world in the form of pixels, it does not know which changes should count and which should be ignored. For instance, a slight change in the pattern of the clouds in the sky in a game environment is probably unimportant when exploring said game. But finding a missing key certainly is. But to the AI, both involve changing a few pixels in that world. This is where deep reinforcement learning comes in. It's an area of machine learning that helps an agent analyze an environment to decide what matters and which actions count through feedback signals in the form of extrinsic and intrinsic rewards. This is something that animals basically uh, constantly do. Uh, you can imagine if you touch a hot stove, uh, you immediately get a strong negative feedback signal like, hey, that's something you shouldn't do in the future. If you eat a bar of chocolates, assuming you like chocolates, uh, you immediately get a positive feedback signal like, hey, maybe I should seek out chocolate more in the future. Egyptian narrative of about 1080 BC, the story of Wen Amen, provides an insight into the scale of their trading activity. One of the characters is Werekat El, a Phoenician merchant living at Tennis in Egypt's Nile Delta. As many as 50 ships carry out his business, plying back and forth between the Nile and the Phoenician port of Sidon. The most prosperous period for Phoenicia was the 10th century BC, when the surrounding region was stable. that can navigate rooms with traps, obstacles to jump over, rewards to collect, and pitfalls to avoid, means that you have to create an artificial intelligence that is curious and that can explore an environment in a smart way. This helps it decide what brings it closer to a goal or how to collect hard to get treasures. Reinforcement learning is great for that, but it isn't perfect in every situation. In practice, Reinforcement learning works very well if you have very rich feedback. If you can tell, hey, this move is good, that move is bad. This move is good, that move is bad. In Atari games like Montezuma's Revenge, the game environment offers little feedback and its rewards can intentionally lead to dead ends. Language often seems so skillfully drafted that one can hardly imagine it as anything other than the perfected handiwork of a master craftsman. How else could this instrument make so much out of barely three dozen measly morsels of sound? In themselves, these configurations of mouth, PF, BV, TD, KG, SH, A, E, and so on, amount to nothing more than a few haphazard spits and splutters, random noises with no meaning, no ability to express, no power to explain. You could imagine, and this is especially true in the video games like Montezuma's Revenge, that sometimes you have to take a lot of very specific actions. You have to dodge hazards, jump over enemies. And you can imagine that a random action is like, hey, maybe I should jump here in this new place is just going to lead to a game over because that was a bad place to jump. And this is especially if you have to, if you're already fairly deep into the game. And so let's say 
you want to explore level two, if you start taking random actions in level one and just randomly dying, you're not going to make progress on exploring level two. You can't rely on intrinsic motivation alone, which in the context of artificial intelligence typically comes from exploring new or unusual situations. You wake up in the middle of the night in a strange hotel miles away from home, disoriented most probably from jet lag, when even the most expensive surroundings can seem empty and dispiriting. You have paid a great deal of money to stay in this first-class hotel with its contemporary technology, but according to recent research carried out by an international travel and public relations company, all is not well. say you have a robot and it can go left into a house and right into a house let's say at first it goes left it explores left it means that it gets this intrinsic reward uh, for a while uh, it doesn't quite finish exploring left and at some point uh, the episode ends and it, it starts anew in the starting room uh, and this time it goes right it goes fairly far into the uh, room on the right uh, it doesn't quite explore it and then it goes back to the to the starting room. Now the problem is because it has gone both left and right, and basically has already seen the start, it no longer gets as much intrinsic motivation from going there. people to change unhealthy behaviors doesn't work. Otherwise, we would all already be slim, fit non-smokers. Whether it's habit, the temptation of an ad, or just the easiest option, we often rely on automatic behaviors to get us through the day. And even though we know taking the elevator, grabbing a beer, or drowning a salad in ranch dressing are not the healthiest choices, we keep making them, unless those bad choices become too inconvenient. Making bad choices harder is actually the best way to help people get healthier, argues a new essay in the journal Science. Simply programming elevator doors to close really slowly actually motivates more people to climb stairs. Limiting the places that sell tobacco cuts overall consumption. And then there's the trusty old salad bar trick. Put healthier options closer than other choices and more people pick them. Little changes like these reach everyone, not just the people targeted with a health message. And they get us healthier just by letting us stay on autopilot. In short, it stops exploring and counts that as a win. Detaching from a place that was previously visited after collecting a reward does not work in difficult games because you might leave out important clues. Go Explore goes around this by not rewarding some actions, such as going somewhere new. Instead, it encourages sufficient exploration of a space with no or little hints by enabling its agent to explicitly remember promising places or states in a game. Once the agent keeps a record of that state, it can then reload it and intentionally explore what Adrian and Yoss call the first return, then explore principle. According to Adrian, leaning on another form of learning called imitation learning, where agents can mimic human tasks, their AI can go a long way, especially in the field of robotics. Oh.
Are human beings inherently generous or selfish? A new study finds that when people have to make the choice instantly, their first impulse is cooperation, which indicates that generosity is innate. Only when they have more time to consider their choice do they behave more selfishly. The research is in the journal Nature. In the study, researchers ran several tests in which each participant in a small group received money and then had to decide how much to invest in a shared group fund. The more time people had to choose how much to donate, the less they gave. Subjects told they had to make a decision within 10 seconds, even gave more than others who were told they had to wait the same 10 seconds before deciding. Because snap decisions are based on intuition, the researchers concluded that generosity is the intuitive human response. But given time, we can reason our way to a more selfish decision. This intuitive cooperation might be either genetically hardwired or a cultural construct. Either way, Next time I run a fundraiser, I'm bringing a stopwatch. In some cases, you have a difference between the world that you can train in and sort of like the real world. Uh, so one example would be if you're doing robotics, you know, in robotics, it's, it's possible to have simulations of your, of your robotics environments. But of course you want ro your robot to, to run in the real world, right? What you can do then, if you're in, in, a, in a situation like that, of course the simulation is not exactly the same as the environment. So just having something that works in simulation is not necessarily sufficient. And then pretty much, you know, I mean, we show that in, in our work, but really what we're doing is we're using existing algorithms that are called, you know, imitation learning. And what it is, is it just takes an existing solution to a problem and just make sure, make sure that you can reliably use that solution, even when, you know, there are slight variations in your environment, including, you know, it being the real world rather than a simulation. If you enjoy sharing all your likes and dislikes on Facebook, you're definitely not alone. Research finds that broadcasting personal opinions gives people the same sense of reward as earning money. The study is in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Study subjects had their brains scanned while they either talked about their opinions or judged the beliefs of another, and sharing their own point of view stimulated more activity in the reward processing parts of the subjects' brains. In another experiment, participants got to choose among reporting their own opinion, judging someone else's opinion, or answering a true or false question, and for each choice they could earn varying amounts of money. Rather than maximize their winnings by answering the questions that were worth the most cash, people preferred to talk about themselves, even though they sacrificed an average of 17% of their potential earnings to do it. For the participants, sharing personal information was its own reward, which means that people like comedian Patton Oswalt, who tweets photos of what he's having for lunch, probably feel like a million bucks. Let's say you have a dog, or maybe you're watching a friend's pup. You have a treat in your hand, so you have the dog's attention. Then you put the treat into a doggy-proof box and let them figure it out. What do you think the dog will do? If you're a dog owner, you probably know. Spike or Spot or Miss Fluffy will probably try in vain for a while. But soon they'll probably turn back to you with those puppy dog eyes. With a look that's both hurt, why would you make it so hard for them after all? and pleading. That, it turns out, is a sophisticated cognitive phenomenon called referential communication. It's an attempt to shift the human's attention towards the problem.
election day, where do you vote? If it's in a church, you might be inclined to vote more conservatively than if you cast your ballot at a school or government building. That's according to research published in the International Journal for the Psychology of Religion. And the effect seems to hold, whether you're Christian, Muslim, or agnostic, progressive, independent, or conservative. The study found that when random people were surveyed in front of a church, they gave more socially and politically conservative responses than people surveyed while standing in front of a government building. The shift in people's attitudes, the researchers suggest, was likely a result of visual priming, meaning that people who could see the religious building were, consciously or not, getting cues that influenced their response. The surveys were conducted in Europe, so it's possible American voters might react differently. But the survey included subjects from more than 30 countries to try to minimize a particular national bias. So, before you cast your vote this election year, think about whether your view is influencing your views. Dogs, as it turns out, aren't the only species who can do this. In 2003, a Hungarian biologist named Adam Mikloshi tested this ability with an experiment. He gathered a handful of dogs and a group of wolves. Both groups of canines had been hand-raised from birth by people in much the same way. He put a piece of food inside of that doggy-proof box. The wolves kept trying and failing to get the food inside. And we already know what the dogs did. Alan McElligot an animal cognition researcher at the City University of Hong Kong, wanted to push this test further. He wanted to move beyond dogs versus wolves. The discussions of those papers and the discussion in the press is all about them being domesticated closely by humans. He thinks that there's more to the story. What if animals don't need to be domesticated, but instead simply need to be socialized? Maybe it's not that dogs are especially social, but instead that wolves are just especially stubborn. So we came along in 2016 uh, and did the work on goats and showed that actually it's probably a general domestic animal thing. It's nothing to do with being domesticated as a companion animal. In a new study, he's gone even further. Enter kangaroos. And kangaroos generally haven't been used for any of that sort of research. I think most people, when I emailed them and suggested, oh, you know, this problem solving task with, Australia, uh, with kangaroos, they thought I was kind of a bit mad or some really eccentric scientist. McElligot rounded up a group of marsupials from three different zoos and sanctuaries. In all, he tested three different species. Kangaroo Island kangaroos, eastern grey kangaroos, and red kangaroos. given that most babies wear diapers, in Western cultures anyway, but diapers may trap more than waste. They may also confine a baby's ability to walk. Scientists compared the walking gates of 60 babies who were either naked, wore a thin disposable diaper, or a thick cloth diaper. Half the babies were 13-month-old novice walkers and the other half 19-month-old experienced walkers. When the 30 13-month-olds walked naked, only 10 fell. 
but while wearing the cloth diaper, 21 of them fell, and while wearing the disposable, 17 of them fell. Among the 19-month-olds, only four fell while naked or wearing disposables, while eight fell while wearing cloth diapers. But both age groups took wider and shorter steps while wearing diapers as opposed to walking naked. The research is in the journal Developmental Science. The study can't predict if wearing diapers has a long-term impact. Nonetheless, the researchers believe walking naked would speed up walking development. But then we are left with the issue of covering the entire house in plastic and relying heavily on the child's ability to communicate his or her elimination intentions. Thank <laughs> you.